Hello, I'm your host, Grayson Brulte. Welcome to another episode of SAE Tomorrow Today, a show about emerging technology and trends in mobility with leaders and innovators who make it all happen. On today's episode, we're absolutely honored to have Jigger Shaw, director of the DOE's Loan Programs Office. On today's episode, he'll discuss how the LPO provides loans to support EV manufacturing under the Advanced Technology Vehicles Manufacturing Loan Program. We hope you enjoy this episode. Jigger, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to have you here because you're doing very important work. Your department is helping to decarbonize the economy with a big focus on mobility. And before we, we dive into this conversation, for our listeners who are wondering, what is the Department of Energy's Loan Programs Office? I ask myself that every day. No, we're, <laughs> uh, we were invented in the 2005 Energy Policy Act, and the whole purpose of the Loan Programs Office was to help really commercialize technologies and accelerate their going from innovation to use within the general public, right? I would say we really started in the nuclear space and then fossil space. And then we added the Advanced Technology Vehicle Manufacturing Program, which really helped us with figuring out how to help uh, vehicles that uh, reduce fuel consumption. So some of our biggest loans were Ford Motor Company and then Nissan and then Tesla. And more recently, we've added loan programs in the Tribal Energy uh, Loan uh, Guarantee Program, as well as the Energy Infrastructure Reinvestment Act. So very busy. We're up, up at 200 employees or so. But the goal is really to help these companies who've made really fantastic innovations, you know, get to that next stage of commercialization. For tribal, is that putting solar or wind on tribal land? Is that what you're trying to look for in that regards? Yeah, we support any of their energy ambitions. I would say that uh, solar and wind is where we're getting the most interest. But certainly it can be used for, you know, folks who want to do carbon sequestration and storage or folks who wanted to uh, produce clean hydrogen or other types of energy projects as well. You mentioned Tesla, and it's become an, an American success story. It went through the loan program. Did that accelerate the awareness of the loan program? Hey, Tesla went through this, and, and look what they did. Well, certainly, uh, Tesla has been very high profile. So you can imagine the loan program and Tesla has been you know, synonymous with the kind of acceleration that we can uh, participate in. But we certainly you know, funded the first 500 megawatt uh, solar farms, the first large wind farms, transmission line, geothermal projects. We obviously have the Vogel nuclear plant that's under construction and hoping to turn on uh, Unit 3 this year. So I would say that we have a tremendous number of success stories, even if Tesla got a lot of uh, publicity. When you're funding the, the clean energy infrastructure, if you talk to a lot of individuals today, there's the cost of getting the, the line there, do you fund that the whole services that have to go into the larger project, or is it just the equipment that goes into the project? Yeah, so we have what you call an eligible cost definition, and so a lot of costs are included uh, in the eligible costs, but corporate overhead is not included, right? And so that's the part that's most prominently excluded from the costs of eligible costs for our loan. And the eligible cost number is generally around this calculation of our maximum which is 80% of the eligible costs. What does a loan repayment look like when the company, they take the loan, they, they build out the infrastructure? What does the payback period start with and when do the taxpayers eventually get paid back? We're able to go up to 30 years. We rarely do. I'd say for most manufacturing type loans, we're in that 10-year time frame. For some of the project finance deals, we can be closer to 30 years. And we issue bonds basically out of the Federal Financing Bank for people who take loans directly from us. And so when they decide to repay, if they repay early, then we look at where the interest rates are. And so if they borrowed at 4% and then interest rates went down, then there is a uh, uh, make hole that they have to pay. So, you know, because we have to pay off the bonds early. But, but in general, I'd say that it's 10 to 30 years or so. Okay, so that's not a very long payback period for the taxpayer there. And we're seeing a big shift in, across America, and President Biden has spoken very openly about this, the shift to electrification, the, the shift to electric vehicles. How is the Advanced Technology Vehicles Manufacturing Loan Program being used to accelerate uh, the adoption of electric vehicles in the United States? Yeah, so our loan program can be used for all sorts of things, right? So in the passenger vehicle space, we certainly funded 
EV manufacturing, right, in the Tesla loan. We can also do manufacturing of batteries so that you saw that with the LTM announcement uh, with General Motors. We can also do critical minerals. And so you saw that with the Rylite Ridge announcement with Ioneer, as well as the Redwood Materials announcement that we made recently, and the Syra Resources announcement for Graphite uh, in Vidalia, Louisiana. So we can do a lot of things there. And then in the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, married with the Inflation Reduction Act, our authority was expanded to include aircraft, uh, locomotive, marine, heavy trucks, medium-duty trucks. And so we're starting to get more applications in for let's say, clean school buses or construction equipment or you know some of these other categories. Decarbonizing maritime to me is, is something that's very important. I don't think it gets enough attention from a, a news standpoint. Are you seeing the, the maritime since the, the, the Bipartisan Act allows you to fund that where these new startups saying, okay, we can decarbonize cargo shipping or passenger transportation? Yeah, so it depends on the pathway that you're taking, right? So if you're doing a drop-in fuel, let's call it e-methanol or some of those things, that would be in the Title 17 part of our authority. And so the sustainable aviation fuels, maritime fuels, is really going into Title 17. I'd say where the maritime activities fall into the Advanced Technology Vehicle Manufacturing Program is if you're building a new ship that can use these advanced fuels or you're using a ship that does electrification or some of those kind of things. And so on the manufacturing side, you'd be in the Advanced Technology Vehicle Manufacturing Program. Whereas if you're just making the fuels, you'd be in the Title 17 side of things. And then as part of the Inflation Reduction Act, there was an additional $250 billion loan guarantees to retool projects. Where does that fit in your environment? Yeah, so that's the Energy Infrastructure Reinvestment Program. And that, uh, just to, you know, one clarification, it's not $250 billion, it's $5 billion of credit subsidy. So basically, we're forced to pay the points on the loan for you so that everyone gets U.S. Treasuries plus three eights. So if we did all risky projects, that $5 billion would stretch to, let's say, $50 billion. And if we did all very low-risk projects, then it could get to $250, where we're capped at $250 billion, right? So just to be clear, we may or may not get to the $250 billion mark. In terms of the use of the proceeds, we have a tremendous number of existing energy infrastructure locations, right? Whether it's coal plants and and natural gas plants, whether it's old coal mines, whether it's old uh, pipelines. I mean, we've built a lot of pipelines in this country, and some of the old pipelines are no longer used. And so we've had some folks come to us and say, hey, we want to use these old pipelines, and we're going to recoat them uh, so that they can hold hydrogen or ammonia or carbon dioxide, right? And so, so those are eligible. But also we have old tank farms, old refineries. And so there's a lot of that. There's also upgrading of existing facilities. So you're seeing a lot of nuclear plants operate. So they're bringing in next generation equipment. So for the same exact footprint, they can generate another 150 megawatts worth of power. So that would qualify. And then there's also a lot of plants where they're adding battery storage or adding other features. Uh, and that would also qualify. So we're exciting. We're excited to see all the different use cases. One other use case we're seeing is reconductoring, right? So, so stringing new conductors on existing transmission lines and 2Xing or 3Xing the capacity of that transmission line in the process. Is increasing the capacity a focus of yours as, let's just say, a million Americans, two million Americans, eventually 10 million Americans bring electric vehicles online to ensure that there's a, enough capacity there is when they either go to public charging and they, they're charging at their residence? Yeah. I mean, there, again, there's a lot of ways of looking at this question. I mean, the first way to look at this question is the grid is a machine, right? The National Academy of Sciences named it the single uh, largest marvel of the 20th century, right? And so the grid is a machine. Most machines are operated to get the most uh, capacity utilization out of the machine, right? If you build a steel plant, you want it running as much as possible. The grid is the only machine that we have that is, is not running efficiently. So the grid only runs about 40% of the time, right? The other 60% of the capacity is underutilized. So one of the things that we can do is to use virtual power plants to up the use of the, of the existing grid. And so what that means is, a lot of electric vehicles plug in for the evening, right? Someone comes home from picking up their kid from school, they uh, plug it in. 
and they don't unplug it for 11 hours, even though it only takes an hour and a half to recharge the car. And so for a lot of people, whether it recharges immediately when they plug in or it recharges at midnight, they don't really care, right? So every automaker is now allowing you to control when your car charges through an app on your phone. And so there are many companies who have said, hey, if you let us control that app for you, then we'll cut the price that you would charge your car at by half, right? So the electric utility is saying, we'll give you an incentive to use the grid more efficiently because then we don't have to upgrade the grid for everyone on the street to you know, switch to electric vehicles. So there's some of those programs going. Separately, um, we are going to still need more new infrastructure as well. And so the 1706 program, this energy infrastructure reinvestment program, can be used to install better generation, right? So cleaner generation on the grid, replacing old coal plants that have already been designated to retire, and then upgrade those transmission lines with reconductoring so that more power can get to your neighborhood, as well as like putting in battery storage strategically at the distribution substation so that you can handle peaks uh, more efficiently without having to upgrade the lines. And so you're seeing a tremendous refocusing now as we are adding all these additional loads onto the grid around how we use the existing infrastructure more efficiently and thereby reduce electricity rates for everybody. When we look at large-scale infrastructure, say a, a sporting stadium or a concert venue or for perhaps a, a large office building, does it come to a point in the future where battery storage is mandated as part of your, your building permit just to ensure that there's plenty of energy to go around? So I would say that it's less about uh, mandating that there's you know energy to go around and more about recognizing that the electric utility grid is the largest commodity supply chain in the world that doesn't feature storage, right? So if you look at like food production, we have grain elevators, right? If you look at gasoline and diesel, you have tank farms, right? So in every large commodity footprint, whether it's mining or fuels or food, you feature storage. And it turns out when you feature storage, it is way easier to run the commodity supply chain, right? But electricity was the only thing where we're saying, let's make this as hard on ourselves as possible. And let's make electricity generation and, and usage equal each other every microsecond of the day, right? And so now people have recognized, you know what? Let's make things easier on ourselves. Let's figure out how to do this. Now, there's a couple ways of making it easier on yourself. One is behind the meter battery storage, like you're describing at stadiums or commercial facilities. What you find is, is that that battery is most efficient when it's only a short duration, let's call it an hour, because then you can protect yourself from power quality issues. You can protect yourself from demand charges uh, peaking, right? So like if you have a hot day, you can make sure your air conditioning doesn't peak and you know cause you higher demand charges. So an hour, two hours is really cost effective for you. What you end up finding though is when you take all those use cases, we're thinking about 100 gigawatt hours of battery storage by the end of the decade. Right Now compare this to vehicles. We will ship 100 gigawatt hours of vehicle batteries next year. In one year. And in 2030, we expect that to be 800 gigawatt hours that we'll ship in one year, right? Compare that to the cumulative amount of batteries that we're going to put into people's garages, people's, uh, you know, like stadiums and like uh, grocery stores will be 100 gigawatt hours by 2030. And that's why this whole integrating electric vehicle batteries into the grid is such a top priority. And you're seeing it, right? In the 2022 Super Bowl, Ford featured the fact that you could run your entire house off your F-150 Lightning for multiple days as part of the reason why you would buy the truck, right? So this is not something that the government is imposing on the system as much as this is something that consumers want this feature for you know, the protection of their family and to be able to use their vehicle for multiple purposes. It goes back to a common thread we've discussed on this podcast, convenience. It's a convenience. You, you buy the electric vehicle if you're in a storm or an area where you have an outage, for example. It's a convenience. You can, re, you can operate your dishwasher. You can operate 
your stove if you want, if you have the ability to plug in the vehicle. The term virtual power plant I like, and when I have an electric vehicle and I talk to other individuals that own electric vehicles, nobody talks about powering their car. I live in Florida and we, we get storms, which are well known, and thank you for the government helping us bailing us out during those issues. But nobody ever talks about, oh, hey, you can make coffee today with your vehicle. How do we move the public perception around EVs are cool, they're good for the environment. Oh, by the way, they're going to be convenient if you're in a situation where you lose power. Yeah, you know, I think it's a it's a really good question. And it's one where we have to work together, right? So we are working with the electric utility, for instance, in Florida. They have an extraordinary new program where they are saying, we will pay for the charger, the level two charger in your garage. And you pay us $35 a month or so. You can use unlimited amounts of electricity through that charger as long as you're only charging the 21 hours a day where we have excess capacity on the grid. And those three hours a day where we have strained capacity, you can still charge, but you got to push a little button and that'll be 35 cents a kilowatt hour, right? And people are saying, oh, that's not really inconvenient because, you know, I just plug my car in when I get into the garage and it doesn't matter to me when it charges as long as it's full when I'm ready to to drive out again. And if I really desperately need it to charge that moment, I can push this button, right, which is pretty infrequent. And so you're starting to see a level of coordination between the utility and the homeowner who want to put in these electric vehicles where they're saying, look, you can do whatever you want. If you want to charge whenever you want, you can. And it's just a little more costly to you. And if you want to be more flexible, we'll give you a discount, right? And I think you're seeing that happening across the country as utilities start to navigate all of these consumer preferences, right? They want this, even if it's not for both cars. There's a lot of people who have more than one car and they're saying, you know what, I'm going to convert one car to electric and the other car, maybe I'll make it a plug-in hybrid vehicle or I'll make it, you know, a gasoline-powered vehicle. And, you know, what you find naturally is people know that it's way cheaper to operate the electric vehicle than the gasoline-powered vehicle. So once they get one of their vehicles as electric, you find that they transition many of their miles to the electric car. And so that is the partnership that we're in, where the Department of Energy has done years and years and years of research to allow for that software, that hardware, everything to work seamlessly. And the utilities are now implementing it at scale. From going from a gas car to an electric car, well, the first time you don't have to pay for an oil change bill, you're like, okay, this is this is really great. It's just those little moments there. You mentioned the utility. It's Florida Power and Light. And what they did really well, they don't charge you an installation fee. You don't have to go trying to find an installer. It's all included. You're getting a certified technician. And so, so that's getting rid of the friction. If they're doing electricity in your house, you know it's going to be done safe because, after all, they are your utility. Getting back to your office, currently you have 125 applications seeking $119 billion in loans. As you and the team go through those loans, how do you determine who is eligible and who's not eligible for the potential loans? Yeah, look, I think that the statute's very clear about who's eligible and who's not eligible, right? So we have multiple statutes, to be clear. So the two traditional projects, uh, programs that we have are the 1703 Innovative Clean Energy Program, and the ATVM, the Advanced Technology Vehicle Manufacturing Program. In the 1703 program, there has to be some sort of innovation, right? It doesn't have to be groundbreaking fusion-level innovation, but it does need to be innovation where we're deploying it for the first time or the sixth time. We can do up to the first six deployments. On the ATVM program, there is no innovation requirement. That program is really around onshoring and reshoring this manufacturing capacity here in this country, right? And so that's the goal of that program. Now you've got the 1706 program we talked about, which is that Energy Infrastructure Reinvestment Program. That program also does not have an innovation requirement. That requirement is really to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and repurposing these traditional energy sites where you already have a union workforce that's trained, you already have a uh, interconnection to the grid that's already being used, et cetera. How do you use that more productively, right? Then we have the Tribal Energy Loan Program, which also doesn't have an innovation requirement, but it has a requirement that the uh, tribe is actually uh, you know, applying for the loan. 
And lastly, we have this CO2 pipeline program, the CIFIA program, where we're building CO2 trunk lines across the country so we can sequester carbon uh, from industrial facilities around the country, right? And so, so each program has a very clear set of rules. And we ask people to, to participate in pretty extensive pre-consultation. That way, we don't have to waste their time, right? So we can say, look, you're likely to qualify for this program, so you should make the effort to put in an application. Or you're unlikely to qualify. If you want to apply, feel free, and we'll still evaluate you under the criteria. But from the first reading, we don't think you're going to qualify, right? And so we do that service for people. And we have 30 people in our outreach and business development team that do nothing but talk to hundreds of entrepreneurs every month to try to help them to whether this is a good investment of time for them. You're making it convenient. You're being honest. You're not. You're not wasting their time. <laughs> uh, well, look. I mean, they're America's best and brightest, right? And so they are the ones who are taking the risk to to really innovate in this country and to bring manufacturing capacity back to this country. And so the least we can do is to treat them with respect and honesty. When you look at manufacturing capacity, I'm assuming that the 1703 was an example of, of the Red Room materials loan went. How important is it for a circular economy so we can recycle the batteries and, and reuse them as more and more electric vehicles come online in the United States? Yeah, it's critical. And Redwood was in the Advanced Technology Vehicle Manufacturing Program because it's a critical mineral that's returning minerals back to the automotive supply chain, right? Copper foil and cathode um, animal materials. And so so, so they, they did qualify under ATVM. You know, something that would qualify uh, in the critical mineral space or circular economy space in the 1703 program would be detached from the automotive supply chain, right? So, so if they were doing uh, some sort of rare earths for wind production or solar production, that would be in the, the 1703 program. But the circular economy in general, I would say, is more difficult for us to, to underwrite because oftentimes circular economy projects have a lot of beneficial qualities, but they often don't reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So, for instance, recycling plastic isn't actually a big reduction in greenhouse gas emissions versus virgin plastic. It, you know, diverts a lot of plastic from landfills or the oceans, which is really good for the planet and for our country, but doesn't necessarily reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So we work hard with the applicants to see whether we can get to 10% greenhouse gas emission savings, which is where the threshold is for us to you know, believe that they've really honored the spirit of that uh, requirement. Your office has made several conditional loan commitments for raw materials that go into batteries. Is that still a priority of your office to, we can shore up the supply chain for raw materials in the United States and on the backside of that? Have you made any loans around refining capacity? Sure. I mean, critical minerals is clearly a, a focus of the administration and certainly a focus of our office. And you see that with the Syra uh, Resources Project in Vidalia, Louisiana, where we're taking graphite from one of the product, most productive mines in the world in Mozambique and processing it here in the United States. Similar, uh, similarly, the Rylite Ridge Ioneer Lithium project that we announced in Nevada, it's some of the most uh, uh, productive clay in uh, the world that has a very high lithium contact, and then they're using DLE to, to separate the lithium out of the clay, which is a really advanced processing technique, uh, which is great. And so that continues to be a a focus of the office. But I think it's important for us to remember what a focus of the office means. We're a commercial bank, right? So our focus is really around, you know, proactively reaching out to people to say, hey, you qualify for the loan programs office. But ultimately, we process every loan that comes into our office as they are fully prepared with a full data room. They've met all of our requirements. You know, whether it's you know, nuclear or critical minerals or solar or wind or transmission or geothermal or or uh, hydrogen or, or carbon sequestration, we really play everything straight and process them as they're prepared to be, be processed. You mentioned hydrogen earlier with reusing the pipelines. Are you seeing a lot of d- demand for hydrogen? Because for a while, hydrogen was, was bubbling up, bubbling up, and then it just seems electrification has overtaken it. But then if you look at class eight, hydrogen technology there seems to be bubbling up again. Yeah, so there's a couple of angles to hydrogen. One is that, you know, the IRA has this $3 per kilogram credit for clean hydrogen. And so the final rules are still being worked out by Treasury there. 
But we are seeing an extraordinary amount of commercial interest in hydrogen, not only through our office where we've done two hydrogen deals, right? The monolith materials deal in Halem, Nebraska, as well as the Delta ACES project in uh, Delta, Utah. And so we have many more hydrogen projects in the loan programs office, and mostly that's on the production side of hydrogen. And so I believe pretty strongly that we'll hit the full 10 million tons of clean hydrogen by 2030 that we need to offset the 10 million tons of gray hydrogen that we currently produce in this country. And so I think we're on track to doing that on the production side. Now, on the use case side, right, there's a couple of things that we need to do uh, in answer to your question on Class 8 vehicles. One is we need to produce hydrogen Class 8 vehicles in this country. And right now, we don't produce them at scale. And so as a result, the cost of Class 8 hydrogen-powered vehicles are much higher than one would want because they're one-off custom-made products. Second is that you have a lot of hydrogen refueling infrastructure that has to be built. And so you see some of that in California, and then there's others that are being produced with in conjunction with some of these hydrogen hubs that we're supporting here in the United States. But I'd say that in general, where you see the most interest in hydrogen for Motive applications is really in forklifts, right? So that's plug power. There are tens of thousands of them uh, being deployed uh, today. You see a lot of interest in mining equipment, in uh, construction equipment, I'd say. I think that on the the road equipment side of things, we're seeing a, a lot more interest there in Europe. And then I think if we get to scale there, my sense is a lot of those producers will come from Europe to the United States. Uh, but we're not, frankly, seeing a lot of that in our office today. The other place we're seeing a ton of interest in hydrogen is in uh, aviation, particularly for short-haul flights, right, the 300-mile flights, as well as helicopters, as well as, you know, some of these, like, transit buses and some of these other areas. And so we're excited about the hydrogen use case for vehicles, but I think we have to be cautious about the loan programs office. We're the last step of the process, so we're not on the R and D side where we have a ton of work going on there. We're really on the you know somebody is scaling up a commercial facility to ship thousands of units. Aviation is a very good point. We saw the press release from United Airlines where they're working together with a consortium to decarbonize the skies. It's becoming for the United States carriers to to decarbonize there. You mentioned earlier when electricity was built, no storage. Are we going to have that same problem with green hydrogen? Or is an entrepreneur saying, wait a second, we've learned this lesson. We're going to build storage at the same time? Well, I think, again, this depends on what the use case is. So for the Delta ACES project, the main feature of that project was storage, right? We've got one of the best salt caverns in the entire West, and we're going to be uh, storing so much hydrogen there that it'll actually be more than all the stationary battery storage that we expect by 2030 in one cavern. And they're building two caverns <laughs> worth of storage there, right? So one cavern will, will be storing more hydrogen than all of the stationary battery storage we expect by 2030 on the grid. And there's about 15 additional caverns that have been scoped out where people want to use them for hydrogen storage. And so I think from that perspective, hydrogen storage, I think, will be a big thing and it will happen. Now, the question is, if you want storage in one specific spot, uh, that's pretty expensive today, right? So if you have reinforced carbon fiber storage or other types of gaseous hydrogen storage, it's pretty expensive. But we have a ton of in R&D occurring there now that's reducing the cost of that today. And so you've got a couple of approaches to on-demand hydrogen production the folks are looking at for aviation. And then you have some where people are converting uh, electricity or natural gas to hydrogen and then storing it on site. Because right now you really only need enough to refuel, let's say, three or four flights a day. You're not looking for enough to refuel an entire airport. And so, you know, I think I think we've got the technology today to do it. And then that technology is improving over time. In your, in your previous career in the private sector, you were a, a clean tech executive. I'd love to know, in your opinion, what is the best way to usher in and strengthen a clean energy supply chain domestically here in the United States? Well, I think we start by suggesting that we have a lot of planning tools here in the United States, right? So we can plan the supply chain, plan hydrogen decarbonization, plan industrial decarbonization, plan you know the resurgence of nuclear power in this country. We can do all sorts of planning. 
right? But ultimately, the United States is private sector-led, government-enabled, right? So all the plans in the world only come to fruition when the private sector decides to put capital against those plans. And they pick companies for all sorts of reasons, right? Sometimes they pick them because they believe that the technology is the best, but a lot of times they pick companies to back because they think the management team is superior to other management teams, even if the technology is only third best, right? And so I think that it's important for everyone to recognize that we live and die by what the private sector decides to do. They're the ones who pick the winners and losers. And what the government does is say, once you've been chosen by the private sector, we can provide you with low-cost loans from the Loan Programs Office. We can provide you grants from the Office of Clean Energy Demonstration, right? Which has a matching component to it, which the private sector is providing, right? We can provide tax credits from the Inflation Reduction Act, right? But ultimately, all of those things are unlocked by private sector decision-making. And so we are asking the private sector to be more aggressive in telling us what they're choosing to do, right? And and part of the way we uh, facilitate that is we have these commercial liftoff documents that we're writing. And so the first four that are coming out soon are in nuclear, hydrogen, uh, carbon management, and long-duration energy storage. And there we're saying to the private sector, tell us what you're allocating capital to. Right, We've done all this econometric sort of work saying these are the first four use cases that should go first. But the private sector sometimes says, eh, we like this use case better. <laughs> Great. If you're putting $20 billion behind it, I want to know about it. And then we'll reallocate the money at the Department of Energy to make sure that your decisions are the most successful it can be within you know, the the foundations of science, right? We don't want to be violating any laws of thermodynamics around here. How fast are you able to reallocate potential loan funds? Is it a long, complicated process or can you move like the private sector and there's enough demand? So the loan funds are easy because we have very broad categories and we're not allocating money to any specific sector. We're allocating capital to any loan from any sector that meets our requirements, right? So whether it's like in the Title 17 program, the 1703 and the 1706, it, that spans 15 different sectors, right? So we don't have to reallocate between the sectors. But I'd say that for a lot of our grant programs, we put together funding opportunity announcements, and then there's a scoring mechanism in those FOAs around, you know, here's what we're solving for. And so based on private sector feedback, we can change the way in which we solve for who wins those grant program announcements based on what the private sector is telling us is needed to be demonstrated so that they can then put the next dollars into commercializing the technology. I like the fact that uh, you use the term a commercial bank. I'll call you a a clean energy commercial (laughs) bank that's in touch with the private sector and you're matching and, and enabling stuff to scale. In your opinion, what is the future of the clean economy? You're sitting here in government. You're having, you came from private sector. You're having those relationships. You got a pretty good magic ball to where this is going. Yeah. Look, I think that we have hundreds of companies that have received over $60 billion of venture capital in 2021 and again in 2022. Right. And so there are probably thousands of companies in there, but I'm only tracking the ones that are later stage, right? They've gotten. C rounds and D rounds, they've demonstrated their technology and now they're ready for the loan programs office, right? Once that occurs, we're still 10 years away from relevance, right? So when you look at all of the loans that we provided in the 2010, 2011 timeframe in the loan programs office, right? The first 500 megawatt solar farms, solar was still less than 2% of production on the grid until four years ago, right? And so when you think about, we in, we provided those loans in 2010, they were not relevant to grid scale until 2020, right? And the same thing's true with Tesla. Like, I, you know, I think Tesla's extraordinary. But when you think about where they were in 2009 when we provided the loan, then they went public in, I think, 2012 maybe. And then they were not profitable, I think, maybe until 2018, 2019. They were not relevant in terms of total car sales until 10 years after we provided that loan, right? And so 
they were awesome. There were a lot of people who had Model S's, right? But today, the Model S is one of their, you know, lower volume cars. It's really the Model, you know, 3, the Model Y, right? And those are the ones that are really, you know, taking off, right? And so when you think about relevance, relevance is in gigaton scale. <laughs> relevance is not in market capitalization. So there's a lot of companies that are like, they're worth $50 billion on the stock market. Great, but they're producing one battery a week. That's not relevant, right? <laughs> and so, like, so I just want to make sure people understand that we are tied to relevance, which is around carbon reduction and greenhouse gas emission reduction, right? And so those are all technologies that are five plus years old, right? So by definition, I am busy working on relevance, not on, you know, first of a kind um, demonstrations, Right. So, and even the first of a kind deployments that we're funding, like monolith materials that we provide a conditional commitment to, I think that technology is awesome. And they make carbon black, which even electric vehicles need tires, and carbon black is in making tires. But they're not going to be relevant until they produce 20 of those factories. Right. And so I just think it's important for us to be careful about mixing and matching the hype cycle and the relevance cycle. I like that. You're finding stuff really that, that will have a positive impact on carbon emissions. And if you want to use the private sector term, you're, an, you're a patient investor. You're finding a relevant sector that will meet your goals and you're waiting because we never know what was going to happen with Tesla. We all saw the reportings and the up and downs and it, it turned into a great American success story. But if we're having this conversation 10 years ago. We're having, a, we're having a different conversation. But I like this. You're focused on the relevance. You're focused on lowering carbon, which is good for the environment and, and good for all citizens around the globe. And, and Jiger, as we look to wrap up this insightful conversation, what would you like our listeners to take away with them today? Well, look, I, I mean, I think it is very clear to me that America uh, leads the world every 20 years in lots of different sort of phases, whether it's our manufacturing capacity after World War II, whether it was the information, you know, computer revolution, then it was the internet revolution and social media. Today, I would posit to you that the most exciting way that we're leading the world today is in our innovation around climate technologies, right? We have the world's best nuclear technologies. Um, the Canadians, the Ontario Power Group, decided to build a G. Itachi design. Tennessee Valley Authority is doing the same. We have the world's best electrolyzer technologies, right? And you're seeing people scaling up those technologies. We're exporting them to Europe and around the world. We have the nation's best carbon management technologies, whether it's direct air capture or traditional carbon management, where we're injecting carbon dioxide into class six wells, right? Like we're doing a million tons a year right now in ADMs facilities uh, from an ethanol facility into Illinois, right? We have the best technology in terms of advanced conductors for uh, transmission lines, HVDC lines, right? We have the best technologies in the world around next generation battery technologies, right? So when people talk about uh, lithium phosphate, you know, iron phosphate batteries, that's DOE technology invented at the UT Austin, right, university and licensed to Chinese companies, right? And we now have the next five technologies uh, ready to go that we're going to be deploying here in this country. And we're not going to license it to Chinese companies this time around. We're going to manufacture them here in this country, right? So I want to make sure people understand just how in the lead America is. We just didn't choose to manufacture them here in this country a decade ago. Today, we've pivoted. We want to manufacture all these technologies here, create great American jobs here. And then once we've made them here, we're going to be exporting not only that product, but also our technologies around the world to help our allies decarbonize around the world. It's going to be extraordinary. It's going to be extraordinary, and it's going to be great for the U.S. economy because America enables innovation. America is the home of the entrepreneur, and America will lead on all forms of climate technology. Today is tomorrow, tomorrow is today, and the future is a clean economy. Jiger, thank you so much for coming on SAE tomorrow today. My pleasure. Thanks for your interest, and thanks for all the, the time you guys are spending on, on, on this really important topic. Thank you for listening to SAE tomorrow today. If you've enjoyed this episode and would like to hear more, please kindly rate, review, and let us know what topics you'd like for us to explore next. Be sure to join us next week for another episode of SAE Tomorrow Today Unplugged, where I'll share my candid insights on the future of mobility. 
SAE International makes no representations as to the accuracy of the information presented in this podcast. The information and opinions are for general information only. SAE International does not endorse, approve, recommend, or certify any information, product, process, service, or organization presented or mentioned in this podcast.